everybody, and uh, thank you for coming along to our webinar today. Let's hear about single and intracell bacterial infrared spectroscopy. Uh, our main speaker today will be Professor Roy Goodacre from the University of Liverpool, whose bio uh, you can read from our website or from the email you received for the webinar. Uh, today, we'll be recording the webinar, so it will be available for on-demand viewing if you want to share that with anyone else. You can also type in any questions along the way, and we'll endeavour to uh, answer them at the end. Anything that we cannot answer for time reasons, we will get back to you shortly uh, via email. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce uh, my first part, about a third of the webinar, um, and then I'll hand over to uh, Roy for the remainder for the main part. So today uh, I'll take you through uh, a little bit of the background on, on FTIR and Raman um, and its current limitations. Uh, we'll do a very quick run through of how the technique actually works. I'll give you a few high level examples uh, in other areas of life science application, and then I'm going to hand over to Roy for the main part of the talk. So, uh, for those who are familiar with infrared and, Ra and Raman spectroscopy, I'll be talking about infrared here first. The, the, one of the main uh, issues, and it's kind of reached its fundamental um, maturity and, and uh, it's hit sort of technical limits, uh, it's infrared spatial resolution. So, uh, we, we, as we're working with long infrared wavelengths, our uh, spatial resolution is naturally limited. It's also a complex cell preparation, uh, in the best, uh, res the best uh, spectra are obtained with uh, thin cuts, typically five to 20, and some things you just can't cut very thin or it can be very difficult to do. Some of those are mitigated with uh, with ATR, but that requires contact, and, you know, direct intimate contact, and it can be difficult to target, so there's risk of cross-contamination um, and so on. In fact, you can see some uh, sample there with ATR indentation along the way. Uh, one of the Underappreciated or perhaps lesser known uh, issues is really, uh, really around dispersive scatter artifacts. So here I have a spectrum of PMMA collected in transmission mode. Let's imagine that being a thin film. They take the exact same material and collect it uh, on a bead uh, in transmission mode. The spectra looks look very, very different. Um, and then the spectra really become size dependent. Uh, so again, you know, infrared spectra, in regular traditional infrared spectra, we can be very much sample, uh, shape, size, and surface roughness dependent. So that's on the infrared. Now on the Raman side, uh, there are also uh, sort of technical limitations and that come from maturity. Uh, there's autofluorescence, uh, which can swamp the signal, and anyone who's, pra who's, who's a Raman practitioner will know that very, very well. Of course, you can mitigate some of that by going to long wavelengths, but you lose uh, a large amount in, in sensitivity, uh, limited sensitivity uh, links to that, and it's just it's a fundamental issue with Brahma. And the cross section is ten to the eight smaller than for IR. Of course, if you're doing live cell uh, phototoxicity, um, can be an issue, especially if you're pumping in tens of milliwatts. Um, Q uh, the OPTIR technique. So it really is a, a pump probe optical spectroscopy technique uh, where the pump is an infrared laser to excite the sample and the probe is a short wavelength laser to, as the name suggests, probe the sample. Uh, it delivers submicron microscopy. Uh, so it's very much like a Raman microscope in that sense, but it delivers the infrared richness of infrared spectroscopy. Uh, the spectra we get uh, out of this uh, are very much like a regular FTI transmission uh, spectrum, uh, but they're delivered in reflection mode uh, without any of the distortions, artifacts, uh, and interference fringes um, that I mentioned before. And it's non-contact, it's a far field technique. Okay. And of course, uh, spatial resolution, it's another key point, is wavelength independent. Okay. So how does it work? Uh, we deliver pulsed infrared light through a regular Cassegrain objective onto the sample surface. Uh, of course, that has a fairly wide diffraction limit. At the same time, we deliver the visible probe beam, and that can be tight, focused to a much tighter spot. Um, as we're tuning our infrared wavelengths, we get absorption at, at certain points along the wavelength tune, uh, and that generates thermal expansion, uh, changes in refractive index, and, and those two together uh, change how the green light is reflected back. So we end up uh, measuring the green light intensity uh, as we tune our infrared wavelength, and from that we can extract out the infrared spectrum. Um, and, and, and because of the Q-cell, you can also do uh, fixed frequency imaging. You can stop at particular bands and then move the sample to obtain single frequency imaging. Okay, just very quickly, um, I want to take you through 
traditional uh, comparison of traditional IR and Raman microscopy, their strengths and, and, and weaknesses against certain points. So against spatial resolution, uh, Raman's going to win out uh, hands down always. Um, that's why I've given that a green and a red. For fluorescence interference, it's going to be the other way around. Raman's going to be fairly poor uh, and, and IR is going to be, well, perfect. Um, spectral sensitivity, again, fundamentally speaking, Raman's uh, weaker in that sense. That, that feeds into sp speed of measurement. Uh, when it comes to how many spectral libraries exist in databases, typically 10 to 1 uh, in, in favor of IR, and also IR is generally more spectrally interpretable, more rich. Um, if you want to collect in uh, reflection mode, so non contact, uh, there Raman will win out because it, it's nearly always in, uh, in a reflection geometry. Um, whereas IR doesn't work so well. Water vapor can be an issue for IR. Uh, water solvent compatibility issue for IR, but not for Raman. Glass substrates are a big no-no for IR and generally not so much of an issue for Raman. And as I mentioned a little before, the spatial um, independence, spatial resolution independence of wavelengths um, I'll show you in a second how that works as well. But um, so what we do with the OPTIR is basically take all of those and quite literally combine them into a single instrument. So we're taking the best elements of Raman and the best elements of IR and putting them into a single platform. Okay, I um, want to show quickly uh, if you're curious to see how OPTIR spectra compare to reference spectra of, of FTI. So this is some new data collected on our, on our new QCL, uh, which includes a CH range to give it a fingerprint. Uh, and so in red, we've got uh, polystyrene, so it's a rather FTIR reference spectra, and the black are OPTIR spectra. And I've done this for five different polymers. If you a quick glance at that, you'll see that the spectra are almost an absolutely perfect match. Uh, and, and the FTIR, are of thick, of thin films rather, in transmission, and the OPTI have been collected of thick blocks of the same polymer material, but in reflection mode. Okay, spatial resolution is no, another one of the key um, elements of of OPTI and differentiators. So I mentioned before how it's wavelength independent. So if you take the Rayleigh criterion, which is an approximation to spatial resolution, you can see that it's highly wavelength dependent uh, by lambda. Uh, it's, and, and if you take a regular numerical aperture for an objective on an FTIR, you'll see that it can be anywhere up in the sort of low teens for spatial resolution in the fingerprint region before it gets down to sort of maybe three uh, microns out in the, um, kind of the high wave number range. Um, but with OPTIR, and this is very similar to Raman as well, because the probe wavelength is fixed, so too is the spatial resolution and because we have a short wavelength laser together with a high numerical aperture objective uh, the th theoretical resolution is just over 400 nanometers and again that's fixed along the entire wavelength so relative to uh, what regular ir would be getting in the fingerprint region you're looking upwards of sort of a 30x improvement in resolution okay and because we're also using this green or, or even a 785 um, probe beam uh, that enables simultaneous infrared and Raman, right? So that's giving us same spot, same submicron resolution at the same time. Uh, and how that's working is we've got the infrared beam uh, laser uh, from the QCL that's focused down onto the uh, objective, onto your sample. At the same time, we're delivering the probe beam. So that's where that photothermal magic is happening. The reflected light comes back to the visible detector where we're extracting out the infrared signal. But because we're using a Raman grade uh, probe beam, Raman scattering is happening there, whether we'd like it or not. So if you put in there a dichroic filter, you can actually filter out the Raman scattered photons and only the Raman scattered photons and send that off to a Raman spectrometer, while the unscattered photons, so the Rayleigh uh, scattered photons, come back to the visible detector. So that's really how you get truly simultaneous infrared and Raman, that's giving you access or take advantage of the complementarity of infrared. It's also giving you confirmatory analysis as well. It's all happening on the one platform, so there's no sample registration issues. Okay, so just a few um, application overviews uh, before I hand over to Roy. Uh, it's worth pointing out that there's been a phenomenal rise in publications, and that's you know, really exciting and, and is a testament to uh, what this instrument is able to do. Uh, one of my early examples has been a cheek cell measured in water. 
Uh, so this was uh, one of my own cheek cells, putting it on down on, on a calcium fluoride slide, drop of water and a, and a calcium fluoride cover slip. And when you focus through, uh, I picked out a few points. Uh, the spectra I collected looked like this, and I noticed that there were a few um, interesting peaks. So I tuned the QCL to those three uh, wave numbers and then scanned the sample for only those three wave numbers. And so when I do an RGB overlay, I get what looks like almost a fluorescence image. So here we've been able to detect inclusions between half a micron to a micron, lipid inclusions. Not surprisingly, uh, nucleic acid is most prominent in the nucleus, and of course, protein is everywhere. Um, tissue examples here, this is with the courtesy of Nick Stone, who uh, hopefully will be publishing this soon. So he was interested in microcalcification. So we went in there and tuned to 1050, where the calcifications are known to appear and it just lit up like a Christmas tree. Uh, and what was really surprising was that a lot of these inclusions were really, really small. And with their FTO, with the regular FTR imaging system, this was sort of smoothed out. It was kind of more uh, uniform, but it was actually quite heterogeneous. So we've got some uh, representative spectra on and off. Uh, so we can see really strong calcification peaks where you're on calcifications and, 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 and uh, regular protein peaks, uh, protein looking spectra elsewhere. Uh, but again, some of these were averaging uh, five microns and, and some of them were well under a micron. Um, and, and with the high spatial resolution as well, when you're on these uh, regions, these calcifications, the specs you get from them are much more pure, quote unquote. They're not uh, spatially averaged. Okay. Um, again, one of the uh, early present, uh, publications from last year in advanced science, and this is, uh, was a uh, really powerful paper as well, uh, where OPTR was used to investigate polymorphic amyloid aggregates directly in the neurons. Uh, so this is only a snippet from the paper, of course, but uh, when you were on and off these neurons, even when you're separated by uh, under 300 nanometers, you can actually see spectral differences uh, between uh, beta sheet structures um, and, and more regular protein structures. Uh, this is a publication that's in submission. Um, it's a courtesy of um, Professor uh, Joseph Surususu. Um, and this, one of the really exciting parts of this is we're working now on glass slides. So this is really taking uh, biospectroscopy towards the clinic. It's, it's, it's overcoming one of the barriers. Of course, there are a few more to go. But you know, being able to work now on regular glass slides uh, is, is a real um, breakthrough. Right, so these are single spectra of cells deposited on regular glass slides uh, with single scans. So this is about a second's worth of collection uh, for each one of these. And this is using one of these new CH uh, uh, fingerprint Q cells. So we've got access to the CH region and the full fingerprint. And because we are on glass and because these are thin, uh, thin um, samples, you are seeing some glass contributions come through, but it's not uh, blocking like it would no normally be. So submicron feature has been easily detected uh, with tuned the QCL to look at chain, chain length, so taking a ratio of the CH2 to CH3, and also looking at CH2 to protein, so it looks like we may see some maybe membranes of the nucleus and, and overall cellular membranes, and, and clearly there's some localization there of chain lengths um, as well. Okay. Um, as of about a couple of weeks ago, uh, Peter Gardner had their first paper come out. This was also pretty exciting because it was really demonstrating live cell measurements using OPTIR together with Raman. Now, traditionally, FTR is thought to be impossible or very difficult because of the strong water absorbances, which really force people to use you know, sort of liquid path lengths of about seven microns, which are really, really difficult to use. But you know, in this paper, they demonstrated low water background as OPTIR, uh, and together with the simultaneous Raman collection has opened up the wealth of information they can get uh, through uh, unlabeled cell imaging. So let's talk a little bit about how to present the sample. This is an important part of the paper. This was presented in the so-called upside down sandwich. And this is done so that the cell is sitting at the top of the top window, calcium fluoride window. And then when the infrared light is impinging on it, it hits the cell first without having to go through any amount of water. So as it hits the cell, it generates a photothermal effect. The probe is then detecting that photothermal effect and the probe is free to pass through and is measured in transmission mode uh, because there isn't much reflection off this sample. It's, it's actually more effective and efficient to, de to detect the transmitted probe. And this configuration, like I said, 
uh, path length is somewhat irrelevant. So you could have much higher path lengths of water, have uh, flow through experiments without any of the issues of uh, back pressure with those seven to 10 micron path lengths. Right, just a little snippet uh, from the paper again, uh, two different cell lines, in zooming in, we can see nuclear structure here, nuclear structures over here, lipids coming through, um, and all you know, with, with excellent signals and always in water, um, without any water subtraction too. So what's happening is actually you are getting water. Of course, water is still present, uh, but it's now superimposed on top of the amide 1 and the amide 2 is over here. And this is some uh, Raman spectra collected simultaneously as well. All right, so my key takeaways are this you know, OPTR is bringing infrared and Raman into a single platform. A submicron gives you that a lot more detail uh, and information from your sample. Uh, Non-contact reflection node ensures uh, no cross-contamination. No cross uh, one of the biggest ones is really the lack of dispersive and scatter artifacts, easy to prepare. And with these new QSOL options, we've now broadened the spectral range to include the important CH range as well. Something I didn't touch on, but I'm going to throw in there as a little teaser, is uh, this potential there also for the, for the addition of fluorescence modules to enable co-located uh, PTIR uh, also with Raman. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to um, pass it over to Roy for the main part of the talk. Take it away, Roy. Thank you. Great. Thanks uh, very much, Mustafa, for, for that. Fantastic overview um, of the Mirage. And also thanks for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of our work that we've been developing um, OPTIR for um, measuring community uh, bacteria. And what I'm going to do in this talk is give you an introduction um, to our research area in this, and also some of the previous work we've done uh, with bulk infrared and also uh, Raman spectroscopy. So I should say that I'm originally a microbiologist. So when I see scenes like this, and this is a photograph I took probably 10 years ago in Iceland, I find these sorts of environments really quite fascinating. Um, and around the corner uh, from this stream, uh, there was this kind of uh, community. And so what you're seeing here, this sort of grayness is not any nasty oil spill or anything like this. That's a community of bacteria um, that are living in quite remote areas uh, and also using um, quite interesting metabolism. So the whole of this area smells really quite um, sulfurous because they're using sulfur uh, in, their, in their metabolism. Now, if you're interested in environmental microbiology and you want to know what's driving that community, which bacteria or which fungi um, is actually doing that initial carbon fixation um, in order to uh, generate um, a group of organisms living together, then uh, one of the ways that's been developed um, probably about 20 odd years ago is to use RNA and to look at RNA, but after you've used stable isotope probing. So what you would do is you would come along with a labelled substrate. Okay, you would add that label substrate and only certain bacteria uh, would use that substrate. And so here you can see uh, these, for example, um, have uh, been labelled red okay that means that when you extract the dna these are these are heavier because the blue ones have got 12c and the red ones are now made with 13c so you can separate those out with a den density gradient um, and then you can sequence them and bacteria were the initial uh, carbon fixation uh, bacteria that's obviously quite complex um, uh, to do and it requires quite a large amount of material and so what we've been more interested in doing is rather than using a destructive method that involves analyzing lots of bacteria we wondered whether you could ultimately do this um, on a single cell uh, basis and basically it all comes down to the the premise that you are what you eat okay and this is probably a bit of a silly cartoon, but it basically is meant to mean that certain substrates will label certain bacteria if, um, if they use them. So our initial experiment was to look at Raman and infrared. In this case, the infrared was a bulk uh, infrared measurement using Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. And we also thought about doing this in a quantitative fashion. So basically what we were doing was taking a bacteria, growing it under conditions that would allow us to label it with various levels of 13C and 15N, and how beer um, was the person who sort of really drove this uh, this particular study. 
And so we can use or we can substitute 12C glucose with 13C glucose. So all six are labeled with, a, with 13C. Um, so they're basically, that's if you like, six atomic mass units heavier because of the six neutrons. Um, and we can also grow on ammonium chloride as a nitrogen source. Okay, so we swap 14N for 15N. So we grew these in up to 10% intervals, and we also grew uh, some mixtures of those. Is 13C glucose harmful or 15N ammonium chloride harmful to the bacteria? And the answer to that is not. Here is just um, a picture of a growth curve. So this is time against optical density. And you can see in the initial phases, uh, up to stationary phase, and the bacteria all grow um, at the same rate. So that basically means that it's not detrimental uh, to metabolism. Then what we did is we um, took initially the bulk infrared measurements and we did a principal components analysis. So in this, if we, let's say, orientate ourselves here, these are um, uh, biological and technical replicates. Um, this is PCA, uh, a PCA plot. And what you find in the first principal component that accounts for 90 or 91 percent of the variance, that that basically tells you the increasing amount of 13C. So this is fully labeled with 13C and these are unlabeled with 13C. And this is also unlabeled with nitrogen and fully labeled with 15N. And you can see the various mixtures fall in approximately the right places uh, for PCA. The, the only difference here is the labeling pattern. Okay, the growth of these bacteria was not affected and therefore the phenotype is the same. So this is purely incorporation of these heavy stable isotopes. Um, and as this is infrared, if we look at uh, two particular vibrational modes, so here is the amide one where you would normally expect to find it. You find that when you've labeled it with 13C that it shifts, and this is because that vibration is now heavier. Note that when you label with 15N, there's no shift, and this is because the Mi1, of course, uh, belongs to the carbonyl vibration. So only really carbon is, uh, is uh, involved um, in that. Okay, there's obviously some literature that says a very small amount of nitrogen is there, but I mean, it's, it's not really det detectable in this particular uh, measurement. Okay, if we then look at the AMI2, which is um, a combination of an NH vibration and CN vibration, we find that if we're unlabeled, we're at the 1545 uh, position, and if we're fully labeled with both 15N and 13C, that we move to 1520. And you can see all four uh, combinations of that as you have the various different combinations of 15N or 14N and 12C or 13C. Okay, so we found that in the bulk, uh, and then we also did bulk uh, Raman. Um, and uh, the reason that these shifts change, of course, is the vibrational frequency changes, and it's all down uh, to this uh, reduced uh, reduced mass, okay, which is the mass of the two um, bonds multiplied um, and divided by uh, the addition of those. So you can see when you're only going from 14N to 15N or 12C to 13C, this is quite a modest reduced mass. We'll see later when we label uh, with deuterium that the reduced mass shifts more and therefore the vibration frequencies change um, um, in, a, in, a, in a larger way, okay, in a more profound way. Uh, we can take those infrared and Rama data and we can calibrate things like partial least squares regression, um, do training sets, calibration sets, and we can see that we get excellent prediction for 13C, both for infrared and Raman, and also 15N, both with infrared. Um, and, uh, and Raman uh, spectroscopy. Okay, now and I said when we started, we really want to be able to do this on the single cell level. And so if we look at some single cell Raman spectra, these are, these are the various combinations. And if we just look at these two here, so this is the, um, this is the 0% 13C. So this is 12C, and you can see this is the phenylalanine vibration. Okay, this is the ring, uh, this is a 12 carbon membered ring. Um, and when it's labeled with 13C, you can see that vibration shifts. Okay, there are also shifts here um, in uh, nucleic acid vibrations, but this shift here is really quite profound. So this is a, a shift of 37 uh, per centimeter, okay? That now means that just by looking at that one band, uh, because it's a very strong band, is that you can differentiate 13C uh, from uh, 12C. Um, and if we were to look at this spectrum here, that's a mixture of 50-50, you can see that uh, 
maybe we've got a bit of noise in here where we've got that 1002 shifting to that 965. Uh, but if we blow that up, these vibrations here are actually real. And other people have published the fact that the, the ring here is made uh, from erythrose 4 phosphate and also phosphorine or pyruvate via two different mechanisms. Okay, so you can get therefore combinations of either having this label or not, or this label or not. So mixed carbon sources mean that actually these here are real. Um, all these four vibrations um, are real. And of course you can calculate and do the reduced mass and work out the vibrational uh, frequency uh, for those. Because that phenylalanine is very strong, um, and here are some other, uh, some different paper looking at single cells. You can see here's lab unlabeled and here's a labeled bacteria. What it means is that you can go round uh, on a microscope go and point your laser at particular locations and take spectra and then you can say well this bacteria here okay is um, labeled and this bacteria isn't so what that basically means is and then look on to show that that was possible and um, what we did is we took um, some groundwater so they just had bacteria in it naturally that had been grown on 13C. Bacteria here were labelled. We used sort of little laser capture uh, to uh, flip those bacteria out and then sequence them, okay, and uh, that were uh, originally from E. coli. So we probed that, that uh, DNA. So this this all looks nice, it shows that there's nice uh, proof of concept. Question, of course, is what about single cell Raman? And this is our spectroscopy lab in the Unobia. This is Cassio isotope work on the Mirage. Um, and this is Mustafa, um, who came obviously to help us um, establish uh, my happy. And the reason that we're happy. Um, is the single cell um, OPTR spectrum off the Mirage. And so here you can see the spectrum. It's very nice. Uh, it's very low in noise and so um, and uh, also uh, also elsewhere. Um, and if we view on this part of the screen, okay, we can zoom in and we can see that the bacteria that we've taken that spectrum from is a single uh, bacterium in this particular um, in this particular location. So that's our first sort of ever spectrum. Of course, now that you have a spectrum, you could, for example, sit on the amide one and then generate um, a map. And that's what we've done here. So this is a chemical image. So we first have a look at the spectra. Okay, so the red is a bulk measurement of multiple bacterial cells. And by multiple bacterial cells, we're probably talking a million um, or so of those. Okay. Um, and then if we look at the single bacteria, you can see this spectrum looks very similar, particularly in the amide one and two, uh, to the, the bulk measurement. You're bound to get some variation elsewhere because you are looking at single cell rather than a sort of on mass, um, on a, an on mass um, effect. Okay. What it now means is that you can uh, tune the QCR lasers in just to look at 1655. Okay, here's the visible image and here's the integration under that amide one and you can see that is nice and congruent. Um, and if you're interested in looking at that and there's also um, a review on infrared RAM and in fact mass spec as well uh, for bacterial identification published um, a few a few weeks ago. Okay, so then the first thing we thought we'd try with this instrument is to see whether we can uh, repeat uh, the stable isotope uh, probing work. So what we did uh, for, for this is we just took um, an everyday um, K12. This is the, uh, the famous Blattner strain um, of E. coli that's been sequenced. We grew it on minimal media, so there's no carbon nitrogen source there. And we did exactly the same as before. We grew it on either pure 12C or pure 13C glucose. So at this stage, we're not doing any quantification aspect, okay, um, or uh, or and or we grew it on 14N or 15N ammonium chloride. And so the phase one is we analyzed all four combinations of these from mineral media. Uh, we did those individually so that we knew definitely that we were looking at, let's say, a 12C and a 15N labeled organism, okay, or a 13C and a 15N labeled organism. 
and we collected pollen spectra from those single cells and we collected 15 of those so that we had our, some idea of, um, of reproducibility. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And then in the second phase, we mixed these cells, uh, we performed imaging, and we hoped for some of those images that we would actually get all four different bacteria in uh, the same uh, in the same image. Obviously, that's quite technically difficult because bacteria are very small and you're mixing usually in the order of thousands or millions of bacteria um, together. Okay, and then the idea is on an imaging basis, can you can you separate these these out? So these are the, uh, the single cell OPTIR spectrum. You've seen some of these before, but now what you can see uh, are clear shifts in the amide one here, depending on the labeling pattern. Okay, and also clear shifts here in the amide two. And if we do a comparison with the bulk measurement of the FTIR that I showed you earlier, and the single cell let's, uh, for the OPTR, we can see that these are very, very, very close. Okay, we have an additional, uh, we have an additional bump here, which might be due uh, due to unlabeling or a, a different vibration at that particular point. But we can see this is very congruent both for the amide 1 um, and amide 2. I said I'd show you um, the reproducibility and if we were to do PCA uh, we find that the 15 spectra uh, cluster very nicely together and the first principal component again like the bulk measurement separates out 12C from 13C and is about 90% um, of the variance of the explained variance, very similar to what was seen before. And the remaining variance is due to the 15N or 14N incorporation. And again, these cells like before are phenotypically the same. There's no difference um, in growth rate. So you can see the excellent reproducibility here in a multivariate sense of uh, probing those particular uh, bacteria. If we now look at our, our six maps, okay, so if, if you look at these bottom corners, so this is the map at 1660, so from the amide uh, one, this is at 1614, which is where the amide one sh shifts to when it's uh, labeled with 13C. We can, for example, see these two bacteria here very nicely labeled, okay? And we can confirm on this image by looking at the full uh, spectrum here, but remember these are just slices um, of, of those. Um, if we then try to look at um, 14N, it's actually harder to do that identification. Um, and this is because the signal is really dominated um, by carbon. Okay. And, and obviously, most of what makes up biological material is carbon based rather than nitrogen based. So the nitrogen is a, is a smaller aspect. And remember, of course, that for the AMI2, that uh, vibration is also a combination of 12C and or 12, 13 C and 14, 15 N, okay, from that CN and that NH uh, vibration, and hence why we have uh, four vibrations there. So um, obviously seeing 13 C is very easy, seeing 15 N is quite difficult. So we wondered whether we could improve this by turning to key metrics. So in this case, we used an algorithm called partial least squares discriminant analysis. And basically the input here were the six bands from those 60 original spectra, okay, so the four conditions, the 15 individual cells, we just took those six slices, okay, um, and then we fed those into this algorithm and we had two outputs, and the output basically encoded whether you were 12C, okay, or 13C, or 14N, or 15N, so you've got a minus if you were the, if you were the natural isotope, okay, and you've got a plus uh, if you were the, uh, the heavier isotope. So this is calibrated on those pure spectra, okay, the slices out of those pure spectra. And then we take the six bands that I've just shown you in the previous um, slide, okay, and we then project those uh, into the PLS model, and we can then plot um, as a map uh, the, two, the two outputs. And this is basically uh, what is shown here. So this again is our visible image, just orientated, just to show you which uh, cells are which. Okay, and here the 12C, uh, to 13C incorporation, we can see these these two bacteria really light up very very strongly. Okay, and that's that uh, prediction um, on that error on that bar there. And if we do the same for 15N, okay, we can look at these dark regions. So these two here are definitely 14N rather than 15N, which are these others. I highlight this because it's a little bit unusual, and this is possibly because that is the only bacterium on that. Um, on that uh, image that is both labelled with 13C um, and 15 and 15N. So we were very happy um, and this was published 
uh, the beginning of this year um, in uh, in analytical chemistry. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, please have a look um, at that paper. Okay. Well, when I started off, I showed you a community and I talked about having interest in cross feeding in microbial communities. So if we think about cross feeding, we start off with an intracellular metabolite or extracellular metabolite uh, that will be transported into a cell. It will then undergo metabolism. Okay, it will be used to make parts of that bacteria. It may well be there's a waste product that it doesn't want, and that is cross fed. Okay, it goes on to um, allow another bacteria. Uh, to metabolize and of course the interest is is it able are you able to find this bacteria as a secondary um, user of a carbon supply let's say from this bacteria okay so what you could do to do that is you could look at this extracellular metabolite and say well okay let's feed that now and make this 13c labeled okay now if you do that you very quickly label this bacteria but actually this cross feeding here is going to be metabolically quite slow and it's going to take a while uh, to label up another uh, bacteria so it's actually very difficult uh, to see this using 13c okay a sort of better way or alternative way is to use a uh, general metabolism and so even if we just look at citric acid okay which is a catabolic process um, then in this case these these triangles are just where the enzyme is using water to break bonds okay or incorporate bonds and in this case that that water is being used in metabolism and will end up in the structure of the bacteria okay so what you can do to look at general metabolism is use deuterated water and so we and others have, uh, have been doing this to see whether this bacteria here might actually be still undergoing um, uh, catabolism or metabolism and therefore be labeled uh, with uh, with heavy water okay so the first example uh, we did, we, we worked with Wei Wang here, um, is we looked at bacterial co-cultures, so two bacteria together. And obviously the difficulty here is unless this, if this wasn't fluorescently labelled as E. coli, it's very difficult to tell it uh, from this um, Acinetobacter. Okay, so this is GFP label and this isn't. And so therefore, when you look at these under a microscope, you can say, right, this one, I'm definitely looking at E. coli. Okay, this one over here, I'm looking um, at uh, Bailey I. Okay, and so these are the strains. Okay, and the uh, idea of this experiment is that uh, Acinetobacter uh, will grow on both glucose and citrate. Okay, but E. coli will only grow on glucose. Okay, and that's the one that's labeled, so it will not grow uh, if you fade it, uh, feed it as uh, citrate. Now you could go and buy citric acid, okay, that's 13C labeled, and if this was phenol or this was um, an exotic type of chemical, that's really quite expensive. So we thought in this experiment about doing reverse isotopic labeling, okay. Uh, in this case, what you do is you can label up both bacteria with glucose first and look at that phenylalanine, so that will get them labeled, and then you feed in a 12C substrate, and that label may disappear if that substrate is being used by the bacteria. Okay, so that's what we do here. We mix first in minimal media again with 30C glucose. So both Acetobacter and E. coli are labeled. We can then mix them and combine them together and then feed in 12C citrate. And because we can look at a microscope, we can then look at single cell ramen on E. coli over time. And we find this vibration, this phenylalanine, uh, goes from being 13C labeled uh, to 12C labeled. Okay, again, you can see uh, the little combinations under there okay and if you look at the organisms that are fluorescent okay you then find or have gfp you then find that that label does not change at all so the e coli is not growing okay the idea of the general label of course as i said is you could add water heavy water to this and the cd stretch moves from about 2800 to around 21,887. Okay, and you can see over time that gets labeled quite nicely. So this is, you can see the metabolism um, uh, in action. Okay, and if we look at the E. coli at the same region, we see there's very little initially, but we can start to see uh, that band um, appear, albeit very slowly. And this suggests that there's some cross feeding from this bacteria to this bacteria. And in this study, we use gas chromatography mass spectrometry to look at metabolomics, to look at the footprint of the cells or the cells that they were growing in and we find for example that in co-culture we have excessive putrescine and phenylalanine 
uh, in the culture media which suggests that this is using is uh, well putrescine is an end product of amino acid metabolism or protein degradation and here's phenylalanine and we think that Bailey I here is using these or Bailey I is feeding these to E. coli and E. coli is using those as as carbon um, and in fact nitrogen uh, substrates okay so that's all really exciting. Um, now, of course, the question is, can we do this um, with the Mirage and look at metabolism? Um, and so these are these are some uh, recent data of a different uh, QCL setup, where in this case, uh, we can look at this region here from about uh, 2300 uh, to 2000. Normally, you wouldn't be really interested in there because uh, very few things uh, vibrate there. Okay, the sorts of things that vibrate in that region are um, alkynes, okay, nitriles, so C triple bond C, C triple bond N, but also CD because it shifts uh, from the CH position, okay. And we can image, and this is the image again off the amide one, and you can see here very nicely resolved E. coli, very fast acquisition, just a minute uh, to uh, to resolve that. Um, obviously, the, the laser that's been used to read this off is at 532, so the step size here basically just means that we're oversampling. Okay, this is not the real uh, pixel uh, uh, resolution. But nicely here, you can see there's a very small band there uh, from the CD stretch at 2195, which we can now use to look at, uh, look at general uh, metabolism. So this is our first sort of uh, experiment looking at this uh, with Mustafa. Um, and here's the amide one, these are E. coli, these are lawned um, onto a calcium fluoride disc, and you can see that whole image takes about three minutes uh, to collect, it's 200 nanometer steps, as it, as it says. And we can also do the same for, uh, for the CD stretch. And here, what this basically means is you can see that this bacteria here is metabolically active, this bacteria is metabolically active, but these other ones aren't. So this allows you now to say which bacteria are growing faster on a single cell level. I mean, personally, I think that's really quite neat. And there are so many things that one can then do if you're looking at growth rate or metabolism uh, on a single cell level um, uh, within, uh, within a community. Okay. Where's the future going for us? Well, the future will be uh, to look at simultaneous infrared and Raman spectroscopy. So this is a E. coli image. Um, again, by the way, we do use other bacteria, not just E. coli, uh, but it's a nice, uh, it's a very nice model. Um, here again is the IR image at 1655, again, minute acquisition for this, uh, for this image. Um, and if we sit on this particular location, the center of that bacteria, here is the, um, uh, uh, the um, OPTR spectrum, okay. Uh, again, these are slightly QCL is in a different place here because you can, uh, with a different arrangement, get the, get the CH stretches here. Um, but because you're reading off um, uh, that, uh, that signal with the 532 nanometer laser, you can use that for Raman collection. And here uh, we can overlay that and have a, have a nice uh, Raman spectrum. So really, I mean, this is very neat getting the idea that on a single bacterial level, you'll be able to get the infrared and Raman spectrum um, simultaneously uh, from exactly uh, the same uh, the same location okay so uh, with that I'll conclude um, currently I think what we've convinced ourselves is OPTR with the Mirage uh, provides the same information as bulk infrared but obviously it gives you that advantage that now you can see a single bacteria I'll just remind you that single bacterium is typically two microns by one micron um, in size and weighs about one picogram Okay, so it's a very, very small amount of information there. I showed you earlier that you can get quantitative information and that's where uh, we, we hope uh, to move uh, with that. So if we go back to our communities, the whole idea for our outlook is to look at labeled substrates um, and look at these within uh, microbial communities or look at reverse labeling. Um, and in this paper here that came out yesterday uh, by uh, Malama and Howby and others, um, we're looking here at reverse labeling uh, using phenol. So we don't buy very expensive 13C labeled phenol. We label a community uh, with 12, uh, with 13C um, using glucose and then probe it uh, with phenol to look at, uh, look at that reverse labeling. And in that case, we took snapshots and we're also able to look at kinetics, okay? And that allows you now to link bacteria to function and hopefully get that link from gene to function and work out which genes 
um, um, are doing that. There's a long way uh, to go here, uh, but this is this will be um, a major focus. And I started off, of course, by showing you this image um, here of a, of a particular community um, in Iceland. Um, but if we're egotistical, of course, there are lots of communities um, in humans, okay, whether they're in the gut, where, as you can see here, you're up to a thousand species, or whether they're on the skin, um, looking at the microflora, um, or what's called the microbiome. Um, so in our research, we're going to both continue looking at communities, but also uh, looking at uh, microbial communities or the microbiome uh, within a mammalian and human uh, context. And with that, I'll, I'll finish, um, remind you um, of the title, remind you I'm from the University of Liverpool and I'm a co-director of the Centre for Metabolomics Research, uh, where we are complementing our mass spec based um, metabolomics uh, with, uh, with these very nice uh, systems where we can image a very, very high uh, spatial uh, resolution. Great. Thank you, Roy. Um, I really appreciate uh, your time um, and, and sharing your um, expertise and experience uh, with us, with us all. Um, I've been sitting here watching a few questions come in. So um, bearing in mind the time, I'll, I'll jump straight into the questions. Um, there's a few bio ones that perhaps I'll throw your way. Uh, first one would be, how destructive is this technique to the cells? Yeah, that's a really good question. And we did wonder ourselves, um, given the fact that you're uh, you're reading off that kind of thermal effect using a, a green laser. Um, the reality is we spent quite a lot of time early on um, looking at this um, and we've sat on the same bacteria uh, and taken a kind of 100 coads um, um, of that. And by 100 coads, I mean uh, 100 full spectra. Uh, and the bacteria is still there and the first spectrum looks very similar to the last. Um, that, I think, is really quite impressive. Um, and if I put that in comparison with Raman, um, which uses similar lasers or uh, 785 lasers. A lot of people have said, oh, the, these methods are not destructive. In our hands, we've either got the laser too high for our Rama, but quite often we find that the bacteria is no longer there. So um, I think one of the things that Mirage does offer is the fact that, uh, that, it, that it is less destructive uh, to the sample. Thank you. I think it probably um, is, is a nice segue into the next question here, um, which says, how do you see this new IPTIR technique either complementing your Raman work or could it even replace it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think uh, I think initially it's going to be complementation. Um, I'm particularly excited by having the Raman add-on. Um, you saw that CD stretch is quite small. In the Raman, it looks like it's a little bit bigger. Um, and of course, the information can be complementary. Um, the, the flip side, of course, is that generating a, a chemical map with Raman just at one wavelength uh, takes, or one wave number, uh, takes significant time. Whereas you've seen um, with, the, um, with the Mirage system, uh, the image acquisition is really quite fast. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, if you want detailed structural information, you might use both, but for speed, I think the Mirage has particular advantages. Okay, um, I'm going to keep uh, the microphone with you, uh, Roy. And the next one here is, uh, do you see potential for cell sorting based on the OPTI signal like can be done with Raman? Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, I think that's, that's something certainly to be uh, looked at in the future. Um, there are now quite a few papers who, that have shown um, either Raman activated cell ejection, which is what, what I've I've reported uh, today, uh, but also um, Raman spectroscopy coupled um, with flow cytometry, not at the speeds that flow cytometers work, which are typically 100,000 particles per second or events per second. Um, so if things are slowed down, I certainly think that that, that could be done. Um, the issue there, of course, is now coupling um, microfluidics uh, with, um, with, with infrared. Um, and the issue there may well be, is there a water problem? And I saw uh, one of Pete Gardner's papers recently on this uh, using your system published in analytical chemistry that shows that this is possible for uh, mammalian cells. Um, the alternative, of course, is to do imaging and, and come in with some capture, um, capture method. So I think, yes, there's a great deal of uh, potential uh, for this sort of, sort of work to complement uh, what other people are doing. 
Right, thank you, Roy. Um, probably a few more questions, uh, keeping an eye on the clock here. Uh, these are, I'm going to ain't throw it myself. Um, question says, um, with the option for the 785 probe as opposed to the 532 nanometer um, probe laser, uh, does that affect the signal noise like it does uh, with Raman? And that's something that I'm often asked. Um, and you know, the, the exciting thing is, is, is basically no. Um, you know, unlike with Raman, where uh, going to longer wavelengths, uh, you you have significant sensitivity degradation. Uh, with the IPTI technique, the sensitivity is uh, really essentially unaffected by the probe laser, whether it's a uh, short um, or, or, or longer wavelength. Uh, it's completely unaffected, essentially. So uh, that's good. Now, if you're doing simultaneous IR in Raman and you're using the 785, uh, well, your Raman channel will be affected like it is with any Raman system, um, but again, on, on the OPTIR channel, no. Um, next one, another common question. Uh, I really should think about putting this in my slide deck, uh, but uh, the depth of sampling. So what is the depth of sampling? So that, uh, I'm going to uh, sort of wave my hands around and say that's probably going to be a few microns, because it depends. Uh, it depends on uh, the wavelengths that you're probing with. Or pumping with in this case, uh, but also uh, what the material is made of. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, we say probably a few microns is going to be a depth of sampling. Um, and maybe the last one I'll, I'll answer here is um, is if the IR and Raman signals uh, are both arising from molecular vibrations, they're simultaneously observed at the same spot, how do you get a different response? Okay, now that may not have come through because um, I showed in my half of the talk a, a, a schematic where the light is, where the reflected light back is separated. So the photothermal effect uh, is, is probed and detected by the green laser or with the 785. That reflected light is sent back to a room temperature detector where we uh, extract out the infrared uh, signatures. But any Raman shifted photons, remember there are always Raman shifted photons there, uh, with the addition of a Raman spectrometer, we collect those Raman shifted photons using a dichroic filter and send those to the spectrometer. Uh, and in doing so, we're really not compromising the performance of, of either one of those channels. So it's actually a very clever and very efficient way to separate out uh, the Raman shifted photons and then the unshifted photons, which go straight onto um, the visible detector for uh, IR extraction. Um, and I think with that, we'll, uh, we'll close uh, the questions. I want to thank uh, Roy again for taking time out of his busy day to tell us uh, about uh, his new toy and, and what he's doing with it and what he hopes to do with it in the future. I want to thank uh, the attendees for also um, coming along. I hope you've uh, learned something from this. Um, any questions that have left that were un unanswered, we'll get back to you via email as soon as possible. Uh, finally, this is a recorded webinar. So uh, this will be available for on-demand viewing on our website within a couple of days. And so please do share with any friends and colleagues you think might be interested. And with that, uh, goodbye to everybody and thank you again. Bye-bye.